Today I'm going to be going over the JBL M2. This is a end game speaker for many, many people. And it's one I've been really curious to not just test, but to have the option and ability to listen to. And one of my viewers, Clint, I want to thank you, uh, actually reached out to me about a week ago. Yeah. And asked if I would be willing to test out his M2. So he drove it down from Chattanooga about two and a half hours, uh, helped me lift it up on the stand and I started testing it. And I also want to thank Tony for sending his crown amplifier, which is what I tested the speaker with. Now, I say that because this speaker is a two-way active speaker, but it's not built-in active. So there's no internal power. You have to power it via an external amplifier. And the amplifier that you ideally would use would be one from JBL Harmon, um, like a crown amplifier that has the profile built in for the speaker, all the DSP, the crossover and equalization built in. Um, the other thing about this is that while the speaker is a two-way active speaker, it also has a passive network on the tweeter. And that namely is to knock down the sensitivity level and also to protect the tweeter from any turn on pops. And when I say knock down the sensitivity level, let me also mention that there was no hiss that I noticed. And I tested this with two different amplifiers. Again, the OEM, Crown amplifier was the iTech 5000 HD, as well as another crown amplifier. And I don't even remember, I think it's some XLI, maybe 2500, <clears throat> something like that. I, I don't recall. But either way, neither one of those amps had any audible hiss. So I'll go ahead and mention that up front. This speaker retails uh, just by itself, no amplifier, nothing, just a big two way, you know, ready to go speaker, 6,000 bucks just for one. And then you're still going to need amplification and DSP for that speaker. Now, if you buy a complete set, I saw that Sweetwater has a pair online for sale with the amplifiers and the DSP built into it. And they're asking $25,000 for the whole set. And I don't know if that's typical MSRP, but that at least gives you some kind of idea. This speaker can be used for a multitude of things from home audio listening, home theater, as well as pro sound mixing, um, engineering, mastering, those kind of things. So there's a wide variety of use for this. And if you go out on the internet and search, you'll find a lot of people using them for a multitude of things. Most people I know are using them for home theater. The owner of the amplifier and the speaker, both of those guys use them for home theater as their LCR, which is pretty darn impressive. And after listening to the speaker, I definitely understand why. Now, with that said, this speaker is heavy. Uh, it's about 130 pounds and it was all I could do to get this thing inside my house. And luckily the owner was able to helped me lift it up onto my Clipple near field scanner stand because without him, there was just no way that wasn't going to happen. Um, I pulled this inside after all of my testing. So I did all my testing first because there was no way that I was going to be able to bring it back outside and test it with me and my wife. She just can't help me lift it up five feet onto a platform. Um, so I did see all the measurements first and there were certain things that I was going into the measurements or going into listening looking for. And we'll talk about that shortly, but I'll say that, you know, I didn't really hear some of those things, but what I did hear and this speaker is uh, the understanding of hype. So this speaker's caught a lot of hype over the years. I don't know how long it's been around. It's, I think it's over a decade at this point. And there's been a whole lot of great things said about it. I don't think I've seen anybody say anything bad about it other than maybe they just preferred a different speaker. And there is a long thread on AVS forum, which I have linked in this review, which you can find on my website, that discusses a shootout between this speaker, the M2, as well as the Revel Salon 2. And most people prefer the Salon 2, but I haven't had a chance to hurt to hear that speaker. So I really can't, you know, talk about why that might be. I can only talk about the things that this speaker does really well. I, I, there's really nothing I can say about the speaker that I don't like other than the fan noise of the amplifier. They are incredibly loud uh, and you will find many owners who have said the same thing. So just kind of keep that in mind going into this. I actually had to cover the amplifiers up with a pile of blankets and they didn't overheat or it didn't overheat, but, you know, otherwise there was no way I could listen to the speaker over the noise of the fans. It's just a typical pro audio amplifier that has a whole lot of fan noise. So again, keep that in mind. My listening session, I mean, I loved pretty much everything about this speaker. The only issue that I found was that when I turned the volume up to higher levels above like 90 dB, it started to sound a little bit bright. And in the measurements, you'll see that the treble is maybe a little bit too much accentuated for some people at lower volumes, say like the mid seventies to the upper 80 DB region. Um, at least at my listening distance of about four meters away, 
there was no brightness. It didn't sound treble heavy or anything. It actually kind of helped give it a little bit of detail, but that slowly turned into brightness as I ramped it up. And at one point I had the speaker playing 110 dB. I'll drop a video of that in here so you can see what I'm talking about. I mean, this speaker sings and that was just a single speaker. I didn't have any issues with it. Speaker never ran out of steam. I gave up long before this speaker did. And if you paired it with some subwoofers in a room to help distribute the modal effects and, and smooth out the frequency response, I can't imagine that this would not be good enough for anybody in a home theater setting. Um, it's just incredible. It's full bandwidth. I mean, basically in room, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz is really no problem. Anechoic, it rolls off just under 40 hertz. And I think it's like 10 dB down at 20 hertz, which still is quite good. Uh, the control dispersion on the speaker is incredible, in my opinion. And we'll talk about that again shortly. And that's a good intro for the subjective because frankly, there wasn't really anything bad about the speaker that I thought. And I know that, you know, going into a review like this, people want to hear, well, tell me all the great stuff. Well, guys, it, it just sounds freaking incredible. It does 20 to 20 at full freaking tilt, four meters away, hitting 110 dB like it wasn't a problem. Um, that's awesome. Live music, everything, especially like my synth pop music that I really enjoy. A lot of that has... Uh, you know, drum machine stuff around the 50 to 80 hertz region. And bookshelf speakers usually, I mean, they'll play it, but they don't give it really any weight, you know, or, or meatiness to it. But this speaker, because it extends so low in frequency, it gives a lot of weight and fullness to the sound. And I really appreciated that. With that said, let's go ahead and look at the data and see if we can speed things along. Now I am on my website. This is all located at aaronsaudiocorner.com. I'll drop a link in the description below if you want to go back and look at some of this stuff in more detail. Here's a photo, and just for size comparison, this is the KEF LS50 Wireless 2. Um, these are small speakers, the KEFs are, but I just think it gives you a really good idea of how large the M2 is in comparison. I mean, just the horn uh, waveguide area of the M2 is the same size as the KEF LS50 Wireless 2. So yeah, it's a big old speaker. This is a picture of the Crown Amplifier, and let's keep going a little bit. Now, this is the backside showing M2 Master Reference model Monitor, and then you've got the high section and the low section for wiring, and this is where you wire up the amplifier because, again, it is two-way active. Another look at the amplifier, and you'll see I've got the M2 base configuration loaded. So this is the, you know, the original M2 configuration for the DSP loaded into the amplifier. This is a shot of the woofer itself. I pulled it out of the cabinet. We'll get to that later. And a side view shot. This is a 15 inch woofer. It's a big old sucker. Here's a picture of the speaker on the stand. And I'm simply showing this so you all understand how it was measured. It's too tall to stand upright. Uh, the grill is off in this picture, but I actually measured it with the grill on. I just thought it was cool to take the grill off and show you a picture with the woofer. And now we get into the data. All of this data is created using Klipple's near field scanner. It is a very excellent robotic tool that allows you to measure a speaker anechoically, but in a non-anechoic environment, such as my garage, which you just saw. Looking at the response in black, the on-axis response, you can see that from about 30, maybe 40 hertz or so, it's pretty much within one and a half dB all the way out to 20 kilohertz. There are some areas of intrigue, namely in the mid-range. And this is the area that kind of concerned me. And, and honestly, I thought maybe something was wrong with my measurements because there are measurements out there of the JBL M2, but I think the difference really is that they may not just be high resolution. Um, the Clipple allows me to get such fine resolution and show things that other measurements, even anechoic measurements, don't show you. So I think this is probably one of those cases. And I was able to confirm some of these things by going a little bit further, and we'll discuss that below. So for now, let's ignore just this portion of it and look at the rest of the response. And what you'll see here is that the listening window in green, as well as the early reflections and the sound power response all follow pretty much the same trend. In other words, this speaker has a really good constant directivity. And what do I mean by that? Well, I just mean that when you have a sound radiation pattern, instead of going in and out at different crossover frequencies or as uh, there's a diffraction from the speaker or something like that. You have a very smooth and stable radiation pattern. This speaker shows that very well, starting at about 800 hertz. It stays flat right through here in the sound power until about 8 kilohertz. I don't know that I've seen a speaker measure this flat for that much bandwidth um, 
ever. I mean, maybe I've seen it, but I can't tell you one off the top of my head. And that's really impressive. Another thing I'll note too, is that the SPL level, this was not the actual tested SPL level. Uh, the tested SPL level was closer to about, mm, I think 86 dB. Uh, but the way that this software script just scales it, uh, it takes 0.3 volts. And it was really like, I don't know, much lower than that. So just keep that in mind. I didn't test it out at this high of output. Uh, the other thing, we do see some dips on axis as well as off axis that follows all the same trends. And I'm, I'm assuming that's part of the horn geometry. This is a very complex horn. There's some patent work behind it. Now, this is the estimated in-room response, which is a prediction of what you're going to hear in room. And while I don't have my measured results on hand, I can tell you that this is pretty much the same thing that I measured in room. And notice that this area is flat. Now, generally what you would expect, or maybe what you would want to have, I should say, is a nice smooth slope line all the way down. This being flat and extended, it can be good for some people, but for me, I think that's where I was finding it to be a little bit too bright at higher volume. And at lower volume, it didn't, it wasn't offensive. Actually, it was never offensive but it was just a little bit too much for me at higher volume. And I think that's worth noting. Right in here, again, is that little bit of a resonance issue, but let's roll back up here and look, 800 Hertz was the crossover point, right? There's no dips in the crossover. I mean, it's actually really smooth right through the crossover region. So this all down here is not the crossover. This is taking just the on-axis response and making a defined uh, mean SPL. So you can kind of see what the bounds are for the rest of the response with respect to that mean SPL. And therefore we see that the F3 is about 34 Hertz. Uh, the response, you know, mostly stays within this window until you get into the high frequencies. I see this all the time with horns, uh, not wave guides, excuse me, but with, with horns, I see this all the time. Um, in this area, again, that's the problem. So we're going to come back to that. Now my glow plots, this, this helps me visualize the radiation pattern. And this down here, the zero degree mark is the on axis response with the listener out here. And this is the back of the speaker. And what my takeaway from this data is the response radiation pattern is pretty much plus or minus 60 degrees uh, constant until you get to about eight kilohertz or so. And then it starts to narrow up. And then when you get above about 12, maybe 11 or 12 kilohertz, you really start running into beaming down here. But this is really remarkable. This plus or minus 60, I mean, how it holds the pattern so well, not just because it really is closer to a constant directivity as opposed to controlled directivity, but also because of the wave guided nature of the speaker. Generally speaking, uh, most wave guided speakers that I've run into or I've tested, they don't have this wide of a dispersion pattern. And that's generally, generally, why I don't like some of those other type speakers is because they don't really have a lot of room interaction. And I find that I prefer some sidewall bounce. This speaker would have a fair amount of sidewall bounce. Now it's not going to be like a dome tweeter on a flat baffle because some of those can get out to plus or minus 70 plus or minus 80, but man, it's, it's really getting close there in some areas. And I find that really interesting. And this is really, to me, the standout of the M2. It's something that again, I didn't expect, I imagine most people wouldn't expect it either. Um, just the, the horizontal width pattern is very wide for a speaker like this. It's wider than I've certainly expected. Now looking at the vertical response, so zero degrees is the listener out here, and this is the back of the speaker. We can see that it actually holds its dispersion pretty well, except for around the crossover region where it sucks in. Now this speaker has 36 dB per octave slopes, I believe, and because of that, it really recovers pretty quickly from that, um, that suck out in the crossover region. Now it's not super fast, but relatively speaking, it, it recovers pretty quickly. If you stay within the bounds of that suck out, you're still within about plus or minus 20 degrees for home theater purposes, where you may have multiple rows. This is really useful information because it tells you that somebody on the back row sitting higher than you on the front row they still have a good chance of hearing the sound the same way that you do. Now, harmonic distortion at 86 dB, well below 1% THD. And then at 96 dB, again, well below, well, maybe not well below, but below 1% THD, even down to 30 Hertz. That's quite remarkable. This is the part where we're gonna talk about some of that resonance that I discussed earlier. The black line represents the on-axis anechoic response. This red down here is the summed Port response taken, you know, a little bit away. So 
and level, it may not quite be exactly right. The blue is the Wolfer's response near field, and then the green is the Tweeter's response all the near field. Now, this is helpful to kind of reconstruct some things that you may see that look a little bit anomalous in the results. We can see that the crossover is about, yeah, 800 hertz in the measurements, really steep crossover slopes. But if we go right in here, we'll see there's a dip in the Wolfer response, and that's at about 500 hertz, 450 or so, and there's a quick rebound right through there. There really doesn't seem to be any issues with the port resonance or anything like that. There is some right here, um, and it looks like it could creep up right there, but I think that this could also be due to something else. So let's go check out what I'm talking about. Sometimes you get results that look funky. Sometimes that's because the speaker is damaged. Uh, sometimes that's because it is what it is. And it's always the reviewer's due diligence to go and make sure that they've got a good sample to test. And that's what I'm doing here. So I actually swept the impedance of the woofer in the enclosure, and then I took the woofer out of the enclosure and swept the impedance there because I wanted to see, uh, is the woofer okay? Or is it a cabinet issue or something like that? Well, I took the woofer out, measured it, and that's what we see here in purple. And we see there's a little bit of a bump here around 400 hertz. A little bit of another one around 600, a little bit around 800. I dug up a white paper from JBL and I also dug up the specs for this woofer. JBL has released all of that stuff. It's free information to find. And my impedance, my free air impedance matches their spec, I mean, practically to a T. And what this means is that some of this little resonance in here that we were seeing at the 600 hertz region, back right there, that's because of the woofer itself. Now, my guess is that it's a cone edge and surround, um, maybe a little bit of a, a resonance there. So maybe they're reacting a little bit differently to the signal and it's causing them to cancel out. That's my guess. I, I don't know what it is, and I'm not going to go through the extra effort to try to understand why. That's just a guess. But the bottom line is that now we understand where that dip in the response was coming from. This right here in yellow represents the end box woofer's impedance. And this blip right here is a sign of a resonance of some sort. Now, you do a math, this is around 270 hertz, doing some math that results in about a 50 inch wavelength. And the speaker being about 50 inches tall, my guess is that this is a standing wave in the enclosure. And I did notice that when I took the woofer out, there's some padding inside the enclosure, but there's not a whole lot of it. And let me show you a picture here real fast. And you can see that it's pretty bare inside. Now I'm wondering if adding some additional batting or something like that might help cancel out this effect, get rid of that resonance. The real thing though is, is it audible? And in my listening, I can tell you that I didn't really hear anything that stood out to me uh, for my music. If I had the ability to A, B between not there and this being there, maybe I could tell a difference. It could just be that the resonance is low enough in amplitude uh, it could also be a combination of that plus my room influence. So there's really no way for me to say, but I think it's worth noting that this is indeed part of the result and it is real. Now some response linearity, this is compression high output testing. And what I'm seeing here basically is that as you go from 76 dB to 102 dB, the output barely changes at all. It's, it's less than a half a dB. It's closer to about a quarter dB. You're not going to notice that. Long-term compression we see here, there's no change running from 86 dB at initial to four minutes later, 86 dB. There's, there's no output change. And this is with multi-tone stimulus played for four minutes straight, 86 dB, no change. And at 96 dB, again, practically no change. What does this mean? This means that the speaker has the ability to play loud and long, but please be advised, don't do that. Don't listen to crazy output volumes for a long time because you will damage your hearing. And that's it for this review. Again, if you want to go and see all this data on your own time, please click the link below. Uh, I do want to take a second to thank everybody for helping make this kind of information possible. Uh, again, Clint and Tony for their donations uh, physically, you know, bringing or allowing me to, to borrow this stuff and, and use it. I also want to give a shout out to my patrons. I just started a Patreon thing a couple weeks ago. And I want to give a shout out to all of you guys for helping me because uh, I did have to go out and buy some extra stuff to um, move some things around. And that allowed me to get this testing done a little bit more quickly than if I had had to wait. So I want to thank you guys for that too. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments below and I will talk to you later. Take care. Peace.